still remember. And he said, but I'm afraid there are no lines. I thought, oh, wonderful. There's no work to do, just go up there and do it. <laughs> and do you know, though I says it, it shouldn't, everybody remembers that scene, which is great. So that's the answer to your question. Oh, gosh, now you see old Golgilops over there has yeah. sat on the outside. You, we'll, you can finish. You can have the last question. Death. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn, darling. Once. <coughs> and I'm damn lucky. I I must do a new count, but I've done over 800 tennis and um, 46 movies. And only once did I... Uh, I wish I hadn't played the part, because I've been able to get something out of every part I've played, which is great. But on this occasion, in a funny sort of way, we're back to Adolf again, because played him five times, played Himmler three times, because if you look at the two of them, they're not dissimilar, actually, Adolf and uh, Heinrich. And then the day came, my agent rang and said, uh, you want to complete the trio? I said, what do you mean? Wait, well, you've done it, her and him. Uh, would you like to play Goering? With that, of course. Yes, I was even slimmer then than I am now. And uh, so I played him in a series that should have stopped long before it did. And the only, I cudgeled my brains, the only good thing I got out of that was that I got to work with lovely Kenneth Connor, me and Kenny, about your size. And uh, bless his heart, he died about three, three weeks later. It's a lovely guy, but it was in a series which started off excellently, and we've been talking about it this morning. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Called Allo, Allo. Goodbye, goodbye, as far as I'm concerned. Oh. It was awful. Let's go on the front row and then we'll go down. And then that, that way we'll end up with old curly knobs and goldy thing. Ooh, that's it. Thank you. I've broken up now for some bizarre <laughs> reason. Yes? Um, you obviously worked with several, a uh, large number of uh, one of the directors. Which director was actually the most enjoyable to work with? Tell you who was the least enjoyable to work with to start with, was a guy who didn't even say action. I turned around to Barry Foster, God rest him, who died this year, was it? I think it was. Um, and I said, where is he? And Barry said, oh, he'll be in his caravan having a cup of tea. And the first assistant said action, and um, I guess he had a monitor in his caravan. But no communication <coughs> at all. Now you've read the book, so you know who I'm talking about again. I'm talking about, he became Sir, didn't he? Was he knighted? Alfred Hitchcock. What a pain in the butt he was. Yeah. Nicest director. There are lots of them. Uh, the nicest directors are the ones who are not carrying their egos on their shoulders. Right, let's get on with it. And one of the nicest, actually, was Guy Hamilton. Did Force 10 from Navarone with Guy. And uh, it was very funny. Never met him before. And I was, I was up, I came up in Scotland when I had this call, uh, this, uh, doing this film, Force 10 from Navarone, and I loved the original film. Wow. And um, we filmed it in what was then uh, Yugoslavia. Got out, I got out there, and um, you usually have a week to sort of settle and get to know everyone so before you start doing it. And, haha, <laughs> funnily enough, we all found ourselves at the bar. And I was chatting to this guy, <clears throat> and he's very knowledgeable and talking away. And I said, um, So, what are you doing in the movie? He looked at me, a twinkle in his eye, and he said, I'm your director. <laughs> oh, dear. 
Um, but he's, he was very nice. Um, Steven Spielberg is very nice, although he has um, a grasshopper mind. You'll go from here to there. Oh, that, that down there. And you don't know. But he has everything story, storyboarded as well. Every single thing is storyboarded. And as we began to say, he just concentrates on the little monitor. But he knows what he wants. And I, I with one exception, what was that movie called? 1941, was it? That he made, which wasn't a success, but I, I think, I mean, one of them. My wife refuses, point blank, to watch a movie called Duel, about this guy being chased by a juggernaut. And uh, Rod goes off to her, her painting classes um, on, a, on a Monday evening. So the dog and I, Sophie and I, are able to watch whatever we like. But she's so scared <coughs> of it, I haven't watched it for a long time. <laughs> Go on in. Now you can't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was just thinking that um, the question I was thinking of this would be. Parts anyway about the least favourite director. I was thinking about Flames Hill then. Did you enjoy your time there? I wouldn't have. So <laughs> I actually, truth, hand on heart, um, I probably shouldn't have stayed in it as long as I did, but it was so enjoyable. You know? um, and it's a strange thing, you know, I always endeavour, I always do get 150%. Um, and though I said it, it shouldn't, I don't suppose I would have done as many films and tellies as I had if there wasn't something there. But once or twice if you're lucky, it may be a career, you do something which you know is spot on. And there were two instances in Grange Hill, and who would have thought it, a little children's television series. There was one when Ant Jones, I don't know if anybody remembers Ant, but he, he was very into football. He was always being late for my class. And Bronson really went for him. And uh, it was a magical moment. And this is the take I'm doing. You know. uh, everybody, the crew and uh, uh, all the actors, the director came down on the floor. And, uh, not only me, it was, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Anyway, the nice guy. Uh, it was superb. But there have been, happily, quite a few of those. Anybody remember a movie called um, Escape to Athena? Yep. Yes. Yes. A hooey, well, a hooey. Yeah, well, <laughs> a little bit down a pure alleyway, this. Yeah. It's where my character, uh, Stephanie Powers, and Elliot Gould, Stephanie did a sort of cod strip to uh, capture the Germans' attention whilst the partisans took over the camp. And uh, my little character, I played Roger Moore's sergeant, and he had to go bananas and grab all the other men. And, oh, I have told this story before, so forgive me, but it's, it's a lovely moment. I, it's one of the reasons that Roger did the foreword to the first book. Um, because they did the main dance, and then they turned the cameras, one on Roger, and one on me. And we did, so we did ours simultaneously, all those separately. And at the end, again, all the crew, the director, came rushing up and said, Michael, that was bloody marvellous. And I looked round, and there was Roger sitting all on his own, nobody taking a blind little notice of him. And he caught my eye, and he leant over, he said, don't worry, Michael, they're paying me more than they are you. <laughs>
become my um, lucky mascot because he gave Yes, Mr. Bronson a wonderful review, and that's sort of helped him to become a bestseller. And when this one, the one you, the one that is for sale outside, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when that uh, came out, he wrote his review, which started off, "How is it possible for my to go back to the well three times and come up with something completely different and, uh, you know, and equally enjoyable, where does that effect? So when they asked me to, excuse me, to uh, do the next one, I was a little bit stuck, actually. I didn't, I wanted to find a different angle. So the answer to your question is, it's now 150 pages long. I am collaborating, sort of, for the first time, with a lovely guy, German, but I swear to God, his mother went for a holiday nine months before he was born to Scotland. Because have you ever heard or seen a German with flaming red hair and a big red beard and he's called Gordon for God's sake? But he is, we've been talking quite a lot about this over, over the weekend, um, he is a wizard with a uh, and he has taken lots and lots of uh, shots um, at different conventions we've done, particularly in Germany, but I brought uh, photographs back with a lovely one in mid South Con uh, earlier this year. And we arrived at this convention and the government were taking over airport security and uh, they just moved a whole lot into this hotel. And whereas they thought, or we thought we were going to have masses of rooms, we just left one little room until um, the Saturday when they happily cleared out. But lots of lovely photographs, I'm sure the uh, American government are going to get on to me and say, boy. But so far, it is um, a compilation, if you like. But some of the conventions are going to be done purely photographically, and that's where Gordon set them all out, and then I shall write, hopefully, witty captions. So there'll be, I think these are it, you can't say, what on what earth have I put you in it again? What? Yeah. Not another one? Yeah. Am I wearing trousers this time out? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to get in a photograph I'm actually wearing trousers. <laughs> well, no, when I put you in with Sooty last time, um, the photograph was cut down so you can't see whether you're wearing trousers. Yeah, well, I wasn't wearing trousers at the time. No, I know you weren't, because you had a blonde wig on. Yeah. Oh, the blonde beehive, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, if I had a style, it's because I just sit down and I write. And I go off at tangents, because that's the way I am, I suppose. I don't know. And Ros, she does the first thing. I say, why not? I mean, Barry's only a, a bloke who likes to put on a dress on occasion. You know, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> poor old Barry, oh. you'll take the butt of my humour, oh. don't you? You'll <laughs> take the butt of anyone's humour. That's why I dish it out so much. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. But um, there is a competition, actually, that is a lovely guy. Graham, who hails from uh, Rush, somewhere up north. Somewhere, one of these unfashionable places up north. Darlington or somewhere like that. <coughs> and he comes to convention <laughs> dressed in the most awful Batman suit you've ever seen. <laughs> but, I mean, it really is appalling. But um, he got the little thing on the two ears sticking up. A bit like your <coughs> floppy ear. One of them goes like that. <laughs> That's meta, it's semaphore. Oh, right, yeah. Well, I don't know what his is. Um, <coughs> he is launching a competition which will be starting in the new year to name the next book. And the only stipulation is that it must be a yes book, because they've all been yeses. And 
and there is a prize, or you like this one better. Oh, good. Oh. A magnum of champagne. Woohoo! Yes, uh, I went pissed. <laughs> <laughs> now that's not bad. <laughs>
Michael J. Bird, does that name mean anything to anybody? That's right, the Lotus Eaters. Yeah. And he wrote this series called The Dark Side of the Sun. Yeah. He's just died. Does it? Yeah. I've, got, I've been asked to write a little remembrance of it when I get back. Anyway, certainly Greece. Um, the worst. <laughs> it's difficult, really, because we were talking about um, Forced Emperor Navarro. And we were filming in the Czechic camp which was way up a mountain in Yugoslavia. And it pissed with rain. And it was cold and wet and hot. And the, the other one, mind you, I, I love I loved the parts. And it was great. I mean, we, we, it's a strange sort of thing in the film industry. If you go out on a night shoot, which it was, and you're unable to film, you have to wait until after two o'clock in order to get the insurance. So the whole, and it was a, it's a lovely memory of this as well, whole um, unit were in this huge tent, and uh, Guy Hamilton was conducting us in, uh, oh, everything you can imagine, you know, down at the old and bush and all this sort of stuff. Was great. And the other, the other one, again, a lovely movie, also, oddly enough, the weather in Yugoslavia must be terrible. Um, Pirate China, and um, we were filming at must have been the upper mountain. But in order to neutralise the uh, the heat coming out of your mouth, we had to suck ice cubes before every take. I uh, know, not nice, not nice at all, not nice at all. Uh, Right, well, we'll start with you now, darling, because we've done that road, so it's your turn. Okay. Um, what's been the worst convention experience? Convention experience? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, honestly, an, an interesting question, that. Um, I'm not easily embarrassed. <coughs> but this, actually, was Mr. Brompton on tour. Maybe I've told you it. Um, when you get all these lovely young ladies, and the place is packed. I've never, I've done a lot of them this year, this year, and I've not done one yet that hasn't been sold out, and I don't take all the credit for it either, but uh, they are very, very popular. And this, just chatting to this guy, suddenly this girl came up, tiny little grey skirt, dropped the skirt, nothing on underneath, Please sign my bum. <laughs> so I, uh, I very politely signed her lower back, <coughs> and we don't like couple, So you know, be gregarious and all that. I said, come back to my hotel, darling, and I'll do it properly. And blow me, she said, yes, please. <laughs> 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 I had to um, get my. Uh, somebody else to talk to, I think, very quickly. And then, uh, just, just last week, um, oh God, doing uh, one of these at um, university in Middlesbrough, and that's the, the weekend of the storms. It took me 28 hours to get back to the other wife in Middlesbrough. Terrible. But anyway, there was this very ample, I think the word is, um, Indian lady, actually, uh, or Indian student. And she had a very revealing costume on. And uh, I think it must be the old alcohol that gets people going, because she suddenly came up to me and she went, will you sign that, please? <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing, but um, worst, I don't, I don't, because I love them, you know, conventions, and I, I cannot honestly think, Mind you, being stuck in a lift with Barry is pretty <laughs> You know, um, and he didn't have his skirt on, I think that's what stopped you, wasn't it? <laughs> yes? What would you say was your favourite part you played? Wow. Okay, now I am asked this question quite often, and as I said earlier, um, I, with that one exception, 
have got something out of every part I played. So when I'm asked that question, I'm asked that question, I put the part, obviously, the script, the uh, location, and um, put them all together. And I come out with, we've mentioned it already, Escape to Athena. Because apart from Rog, there was Teddy Savalas, Claudia Cardinale, Elliot Gould and Steph, as I've said before, and Richard Roundtree, and above all, even above Rog, who's a wonderful guy, was David Niven. And what a gent. He, in fact, I did two movies, <coughs> excuse me, two movies back to back. Uh, Escape to Athena and The Riddle of the Sands. And um, they overlapped by, well, you've read the book, I can't remember now, but they overlapped by about a fortnight. And I had one little scene to do with David. Uh, otherwise, I was clear. I'd done my part in, in Escape to Athena. And I, you know, it, it's the luck of the draw that happens. But I was a little bit uh, sad. And uh, I always remember that we were all in the same hotel. And I was in the foyer and uh, passed me said, what's up then? So I told him, he said, oh, shame. And then he went on about, about his business. Following morning, he uh, came down to breakfast. He said, oh, you are packed, aren't you? He said, because we're doing that scene tomorrow. And bless his heart, he got to change the show <coughs> to enable me to do it and get on to the other movie. And um, when you're out somewhere like Greece, or away from base, they have to send the film back to the UK uh, for a rushes report. And normally it's wonderful because you finish a part and then you just sit there for a fortnight and have a nice holiday on full pay. But on this occasion, of course, I couldn't do that. And David had also uh, got them to uh, agree to release me, and if there was a scratch on the neck or something, then I would uh, come back uh, for the weekend or when I wasn't needed on the other movie. The lovely, lovely guy. I did one other movie with him afterwards, which I think was his penultimate one, uh, with Bert Reynolds called Green Ice. And we didn't actually meet on this movie, uh, but when I got there, it was a lovely card on my dress. Welcome to Green Ice, Michael. I hope you have a lovely time. He's a nice, nice man. Nice man. Right, your turn. Right. Um, you've obviously worked with a lot of young actors. I wonder if you've ever sort of come across somebody who thought, oh, you're going to be the next big thing. You mean apart from me? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, I was reminded of it just the other day because they've been repeating this series. Um, oh, God knows how long ago, I did a piece called The Tomorrow People. And uh, goodness gracious me, I played Hitler again. <coughs> <laughs> Although this time he turned out to be a green blob from outer space. <laughs> well, you know the story I'm going to tell, do you? No, I know. Okay, well, it started off that Hitler had been frozen in ice, and he was being looked after by some Hitler youth. And the leader of the Hitler Youth, I thought, my God, this guy is very really far. His name was Nicholas Lindhurst. And I was reminded, because they're repeating um, any fools and horses now, aren't they? Uh, for the umpteenth time. But yes, um, it's, it's interesting, because doing Grange Hill, when the kids got to the um, top of the school, and they knew they were going to have to leave. They used to come up to me and say, no, what do I do now, Michael? Where do I go? How do I get an agent? And I know people think that EastEnders is cast entirely from Great Chill, but it's not. <laughs> there are, to my knowledge, a couple, maybe three. Um, but there was a girl called Michelle, Black girl became um, what, quite a well-known pop star. 
and you can see, you can see if you're if you um, uh, you know if you look for it. There were a heck of a lot of talented kids, but some of them obviously were not going to go on to bigger and greater things. Um, it's also the likes of us. I mean, we sit there, and if we like somebody, then we will make them a star. You know what I mean? It's not just talent. There are quite a few, and um, I must be careful here, there are quite a few so-called stars who ain't got no talent at all. Um, but yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. But Nicholas, very talented, very talented. And not only in comedy. I mean, he played Jurai Yes, he did. Yes, sir. Good. Yes. Have you ever had to dance in any of your roles? And if not, can you? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't seen me on the dance floor. Well, it's it happens more um, Star Trek. They somehow the, the Trekkies. Oh God, what an awful! Thing. But they seem to have got it together. They have all these um, choreographed pop songs, um, Star Trekking across the universe. You know, da 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 da, and um, the YMCA. That's another one. It's all sort of one. And uh, I suppose yes. And the answer to, the, to your question is yes. I, I can dance. Um, I was going to have a dance with Barry, but he slipped out. <laughs> I don't know how to take that one. Um, one. I I don't believe in regrets, but. I would, perhaps I still will, I, I, we are, my wife and I, great lovers of the old 50s musicals. And um, I would love to do a musical, but I'm afraid they're out of vogue at the moment. But uh, maybe they will remake Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> and maybe Brian will be up a mountain somewhere, and I could play this part. So I'm doing a convention with him shortly. Oh, and he's also coming to Honiton next year. He's on the circuit, poor chap. No, he, he, he refuses to use a microphone. Doesn't need one. Well, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Well, neither do I. But he can get a little tired towards the end. You know, you wake up in the morning and, oh my God, where's he gone? So, uh, yeah. Will you make a musical? <laughs> yes. <coughs> what do you think of actors as a Vindala? Sorry, say again. What do you think of actors as a Vindala? Oh. Um. Well, there are two types of ad lib. There's the ad lib when you don't have a script, and the ad lib. When a hole needs filling, if you like. Uh, a lot of Bronsons, Bronsonisms, now pay attention. You, boy, and all, those were all just me. They said, oh, Michael, give us a Bronson, will you, here? We've got a corridor scene and we need a justicility. That sort of ad lib is great. The other sort of ad lib, um, oh, God, does anybody know Patrick Kilty? My God, you don't have to watch a lot of rubbish, do you? Do you know my mum is a Patrick Hilty fan? My mum is 71. Well, I had this call, because ever since I did Banzai, now we all know Banzai, don't we? You don't know Banzai? It's the most ridiculous... Um, <laughs> spoof. On a Japanese thing, is it? And they set up bizarre situations. <laughs> and the idea is they should bet on them at home. And Bert Kwok does the uh, narrations. And when I was asked to do it, because 
I was told I had finally become a cult figure. Uh, I said to I said to Ross, we better watch this. And so it on late on a Friday night I should have realized that's when everybody comes back from the pub. And I think it's probably far better to watch it when you're pissed. <laughs> the first little item, you saw three sets of men's feet. <coughs> Does the size of the willy relate to the size of the feet? <laughs> and Rod got up and walked out. <laughs> and then blow me, they panned up and showed the willies. This is Channel 4. They first of all wanted me, wanted me to uh, uh, be judging um, a rather dubious um, porno. Anyway, in the end I did it, and I drank a yard of gravy. Mm. And they had to, they had it marked all the way down. And how far would you get? Well, of course, being me, I drank the bloody lot. <laughs> the only difficulty is when you get to that thing at the end, and the air goes twing, and it comes back at you, it hits you in the face. <laughs> um, anyway. After that, I was asked to do the Patrick Kilty show, and it was ludicrous. Um, they put me in a toupee and stuck me in the producer's house, which was very posh, and said, right, now we've got half a dozen of these um, hairdressers, barbers, that visit your home to cut your hair. And we want to see how far they will go before they say, well, this is a toothpaste. I thought, well, ridiculous. Anyway, I was myself. The idea was that uh, in Grange Hill, um, you know, I didn't, I lost the toothpaste, but uh, uh, it was just that I, <coughs> well, it was one lovely act. Smashing guy, and he did last of the Mohicans, and he always wore a toupee. And even when they put the Mohican thing on it, with that you know, he insisted they put it on top of his toupee. <laughs> Thought nobody knew he wore a toupee. Anyway, I got the little stage manager to play my daughter, and um, we acted quite a nice time. I was rushing to the airport, and I had my hair cut. So on and so forth. Your mother will love this. And um, if you are a visiting barber and you come to cut somebody's hair, you probably realize the moment they walk into the room that they're wearing a toupee. But if you want your money at the end of the day, you don't say anything. There was one lady, <coughs> now whether she was acting, the name of Rita. And she said, oh, you have got wonderful hair, sir, and stick to me. Oh, I say, what condition did you use all well, this sort of thing? I think she was taken to piss, but uh, that was all I did. I mean, with six, you sort of get into a routine. Um, for that sort of program, I think it's great. But having said that, um, I don't actually like uh, you know, they, they can um, take it too far. I mean, um, Mike Lee, did he win an Oscar? I can't remember that. But we were talking this morning about stock, film stock, and how expensive it is. I think, I think I'm right in saying that uh, Mike Lee works on a ratio of about 20 to 1. You will just film, 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 and then put the film together, which is fine. I mean, they, they say that um, if you put some monkeys at the typewriter, one of them, one day, will write Shakespeare. But I don't think that's really what it's about. But there is a place for it. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, the boring Doctor Who question, I'm afraid. But do you think there's a chance of getting you know, You obviously know a lot of what goes on with it. Oh. Um, Quick answer is no. Um, 
the more considered answer is really there is a lot of interest. There still is a lot of interest. The um, the big finished productions, of course, the audio ones, are uh, going uh, going strong. I did a signing at Tenth Planet of uh, <clears throat> the Stones of Venice. So what I did with Paul McGann, keeping up my record of having worked with more doctors than any other actor. Um, and there's a friend of mine in Portsmouth who is, uh, well, he got permission, in fact, to do something of fear. Uh, Web of Fear, as a radio play, because the original has been lost. Uh, he got the writers to uh, rejig it for the stage, and uh, he, it was a great success, packed out of it. Um, and he got on to Auntie BBC and said, look, I've got this here, I'd like to put it on video. Um, if you give me permission, I will give a percentage of the profits to children in need. So, dear old Auntie, the cliff stick. Uh, that could happen. But as for resurrecting it, um, what do you do? How do you, where, where do you get your doctor from? Do you dismiss the Paul McGann movie? and carry on with Silk. I don't know. I mean, that's how sure. with you. Well, uh, there has been talk of that as well. And I think you're not thought it. It's a scene to be set around the interest in buying things like this sexy stuff. It's very in vogue. Um, they did a pretty good um, rehash of the 60s program in the Rand and Popper. Mm. Now, that worked, so I thought, how do you do that? that well, yeah, I think what they would have to do is in exactly to do that and do it in the style of the 60s. Even have somebody around the back shaping the set every so often. <laughs> add authenticity to it. Because um, otherwise, it doesn't work. I mean, I thought that film was appalling, actually. I mean, Doctor Who kissing the back. It's awful.
can't say wank here because Barry will be offended. But um, I think the Dalek might be though. <laughs> but there is, if, if it is allowed to happen too much, you can quite often come away with a howling failure. Um, the opposite is true, though. I have worked. I mean, frenzy. The one that I was talking about with with the Hitchcock um, was not a happy ship at all. But. Um, it came out a pretty good movie at the end of the day. At the end of the day. So there's no telling. There's no telling. I mean, one thing I can say, nobody, nobody knew when we were making um, Star Wars. Nobody had any idea that it would develop this way. You just you just don't uh, you don't well, sometimes people have feelings about things, but uh, not in this way. Yes, darling. Five minutes. I haven't got to this. No, no, that's not fair. Five minutes. Yeah. No, ten minutes. Well, well no, it's I'm on until eleven o'clock. Yeah. And it's now ten two. Yeah. As I said, obviously you want to as well. Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll make sure. Um, okay, quickly. Here's your question. Yes, you're next. Well, you were tongue-tied yesterday at the charity auction. You answered 26 last 10 minutes. Yes, that was somewhat unfair. You leave from off. Oh, nonsense. You only take the piss out of people you like. Okay? And I always take the piss out of Barry. Well, Will, Will, would you like, us, like me to come back to you? I have a question, but I've got a suggestion for you to include. Go on in. You're going on about how you've had to sign various uh, parts of people's body. Maybe you should just call the next book, Yes, I'll Sign That. Yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah, I like that. Better than yours. <laughs> I am shallow. <laughs> that is a bloody good idea. <coughs> Right. Thank you. Yeah, let's ask. Ooh, I'll stand up for the last bit because I can't. You've had yours. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's yeah. you. Wait, you said you've done a, a bit of directing. Um, do, you, do you prefer directing or acting, or are they very different? Yeah, I said earlier on that I, I don't believe in regrets, but what I would have liked to do, I would have liked to direct a little bit earlier. Um, I, I don't know, because I was the head boy or whatever on Grange Hill, and there was a hell of a turnover there, and we used to have to drop scenes, <coughs> and then we'd pick them up in the next round, because we used to do four episodes at a time, and they quite often said, oh, Michael, just knock this off for us. Um, but I do enjoy it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go wholly over. I like the acting too much, or enjoy the acting. I enjoy it all. Because in a funny sort of way, if you are a thinking, working actor, you're always directing yourself anyway. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I love, I love the, uh, the directing. In fact, this play that's going to the Edinburgh Festival, I actually commissioned. Because I directed this lovely lady in Shirley Valentine which was a huge success, as I said, it um, And Bill Kenwright, you know Bill Kenwright, he's the big impresario, London impresario, he's got the rights to it. And he used to be a bum actor. So I wrote to him, and I said, look, um, I've got quite a success with your little player. I'd like to take it all, the producers would like to take it on tour. And he wrote back and said, yes, why not? You know, great to talk about the old days and so on and so forth. Uh, just check it out with Billy Russell's agent. It was the right time. Billy Russell's agent said, oh, no, 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 we can't have that. No, no, we might want to put out a tour of our own. So I said, blow this for a little moment. And I commissioned this play, Morning at the Zanzibar. And it's wonderful. Yes! With Sorry, I'm moving on a bit quickly. Yeah. Because of with Doctor Who being such an effects-heavy show, 
Um, how hard is it to stay focused with you know, robot dogs breaking down and tin cans that where wheels fall off and things? Well, I still wear this bloody bag because <laughs> of that bloody dog. <laughs> Now, doing its first episode, and you wanted it to go straight, it went left, and backwards, it went right, and so well, next time, well, what, was it, what, was, what was the story called? What the Invisible was it called? Enemy. The what? The Invisible Enemy. In a, it just came out on video. Mm. <coughs> if you ever see it, watch the last episode. It's all done in mid shot. Because we ran out of time. There was no time to do the cuttings and the close ups. All because of that. <laughs> now we're on the back row, we've got about two minutes, so you better ask one together because you're going to be together, aren't you? I won't announce the wedding just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a question. Yeah. Go on. Okay, okay um, have you had any time on between conventions recently to do something we might be able to see you on TV or... <laughs> 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 Yeah, yes, I mean, um, I've never stopped actually. I'm doing a, I'm doing a, a series in Germany, in John, um, which is something else. Um, you know, they're miles behind us in, in um, technologically. Um, I mean, we've been talking about all these little bits and pieces, but yeah, I mean, First Frontier is just about to go. Connemara days has already started. Um, and there's this strange, my number one fan, bless her heart, she's been writing to me for about 30 years. And uh, she said, What are you up to then? I said, Well, I've just been offered um, doing the voice of the baggie in a series called Nature's Guard, an animated series. And she said, My God, this sounds like a detergent. <laughs> so they're going to have to change the title, but um, that's been done in Canada, and they're talking about, talking about uh, science fiction, they're talking about bringing um, Lex back in, very strange, <laughs> oh, yes. lots of nubile young ladies, sorry? I didn't know Lex had gone away. Oh yes it has, <laughs> yes, yes. And this headless robot, who's a sex maniac, yeah. got running around on it. Oh no, it is only a head. Yeah. Can we come out? No. She's quite right. We must remember. Um, let me talk. Yes. Have you seen Barry's alternate take on all this death? <laughs> no, he walked it. out just when it was starting <laughs> last night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a good question, actually. We may have to come to you two outside or later on. Because you came in late, both of them. I'm sorry, I got Didn't you, Alice? Ah. Um, it, it's, it's impersonal. We'll think about it later. Um, we did this convention, got about 10 seconds. Uh, official Star Wars convention in May, just before the new movie came out, in Indianapolis. Got it. There were 34 of us there, and 120,000. And there was a, a lovely troop of uh, stormtroopers um, <clears throat> who were based in Germany. I've known them for a long time, and I didn't even know they were there until the last week. That's not what it's all about. Anyway, thank you very much. You know me, I could go on forever. So I'm dancing now. Who asked me that now? <laughs> Thanks very much. See you later on in the day. God bless you.